All right, it's 3 o'clock and we are ready to get underway with today's webinar. I want to welcome you to today's Office for Intellectual Freedom webinar. Thank you for joining us. You may have seen in earlier promotions that the speaker was supposed to be Nanette Perez today from the Office for Intellectual Freedom, but unfortunately she is unable to be with us, so I will be one of your presenters as well as your moderator today. I promise to do my best to channel my inner Nanette. Before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. Throughout the program, we encourage you to use the chat box at the lower right corner of the screen to discuss topics, share any feedback, or raise questions. The chat is being monitored, and your questions will be addressed during the Q&A sessions. We get, this all the question, we get this question all the time, will this be archived? Yes, we are recording today's session, and we will email everyone a link, um, everyone who registered a link to it. And for everyone on Twitter, you can join the conversation at hashtag BannedBooksWeek. That's all one word. Handles and hashtags are at the top of every slide. My name is Kristen Peacole, and I'm the Assistant Director for the Office of Intellectual Freedom at the American Library Association. It's my pleasure to introduce today's webinar, Before the Mud Flies. Conversations for Banned Books Week. You're aware that Banned Books Week is coming up at the end of September, from September 27th through October 3rd. You may have already planned your displays, you may have picked out your books, ordered your posters and buttons, but have you talked to those around you? Banned Books Week can make some people nervous. But by starting early with conversations, you can strengthen your professional relationships and more clearly define your purpose to celebrate the freedom to read. This webinar is going to focus on ways to prepare your colleagues who may not be as familiar with the First Amendment's right to read. Banned Books Week is a time to celebrate our freedom and our love for books that have made an impact on us. By taking a few thoughtful steps to prepare those around you, it doesn't have to be a controversial or negative experience. Before we begin, I want to share something that um, a student created that is an inspiration to me every time I watch it. Because really, um, the students and the kids are one of, our, the, one of the reasons that we do what we do. All right, I'm going to start the video here. Let me know if you can't hear it or see it. OK, let me see if I can't fix the audio. I'm doing a quick sound check. And if it works, then I'll rewind the video. Still very soft, OK. But you are getting sound, right? All right, I'm going to start back.
All right. So the best of intentions, right? For you to all watch later and be so inspired. So I will move on. The Office for Intellectual Freedom strives to educate librarians and the public about the nature and importance of intellectual freedom in libraries. Libraries are a forum for ideas and information under the First Amendment, and librarians are tasked to make sure that every person has equitable and unrestricted access. At OIF, our first priority is to make sure that librarians and educators and users know this. Our second priority is to fight any attempts to limit or remove access. Our guest today is Director of the Intellectual Freedom Center at NCTE, Millie Davis. She started the National Council of Teachers of English in 1989, where she began her work with their anti-censorship program. She was instrumental in developing NCTE's current system of response to challenges to instructional materials and in establishing NCTE's collection of rationales for instructional texts. In addition, Millie continues to work with NCTE members, developing and revising position statements to support NCTE's belief in the student's right to read and the teacher's professional judgment in the selection of instructional materials and the methods of instruction. Millie has more than 20 years of experience in the classroom, teaching at the high school and college levels. Through NCTE's Intellectual Freedom Program, Millie offers advice, resources, and letters of support for teachers who face censorship challenges or who want to prepare themselves in advance for such a challenge. Don't forget to unmute, Millie. There you go. Hey, can you hear me? Hello? Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. And um, uh, I, I didn't really start NCTE, just our uh, modern method of uh, the Intellectual Freedom Center. Uh, NCTE started itself in 1911, and I wasn't there. Um, so I have to move this to the first slide. One of the uh, founding fathers said this about the relationship between literacy and democracy. The most effectual means of preventing the perversion of power into tyranny are to illuminate, as far as practical, the minds of the people at large. He added a few things that I won't share with you today, but modern day writer Jane Yolen says this, reading a book and understanding it takes time, attention, honesty, clarity, and an open mind. So the question for some people when they think about the word education is what does that word mean? And, and sometimes people answer that question by saying it means what I mean, which can pose a problem. Um, the Harris poll uh, that is mentioned here, Harris uh, does multiple surveys, has been doing that since 1963, and they survey on all sorts of topics. But on censorship, uh, most recently they surveyed in March of 2015, and they found out um, that uh, you know nearly 30 percent of Americans think that there are some books that should be censored. And this number has gone up 11 uh, percent since two th 2011 and um, and of course or rather 10 points since 2011 and that's probably not very good for any of us um, they noted though <laughs> that three in ten Americans would like to read a banned book so that might be a good thing to know uh, about seven in ten Americans believe there should be some sort of a book rating 
uh, system like there are the MPAA ratings for film. And I need to digress and tell you that those film ratings have absolutely nothing to do with educational value. And if you were to ask the people that made them, they would tell you that. Um, and the people, 71% that believe there should be uh, rating systems, also believe that librarians are the ones in charge of keeping what these folks think are inappropriate books away from their kids. A little more statistics here, a few statistics. Um, Three-fifths Amer of Americans believe that uh, children should not be able to get books containing explicit language from school libraries. Half of them are worried about books that have references to violence. Some want to get rid of books about witchcraft or sorcery. And some about books with references to sex. And fewer than 4 in 10 would like to keep books about drugs and alcohol out of the hands of uh, children. And, um, and then there are a few that want to keep out books about vampires. So by now, if you're a librarian, I think I've probably touched the vast majority of your collection. Something to think about for all of us. Got to make the mouse work here. Penny Kittle is a real active NCTE member. She's a high school teacher, uh, an author of uh, many, many articles, and, and a book, a favorite book uh, of mine called Book Love uh, that's published by Heinemann. I'll give them a little plug. Uh, and in this book, uh, she talks about her process for getting her reluctant readers uh, to read in her classroom. And one thing all the students do at the end of the year is a reflection. They do more during the year. But here, I would like to read you this reflection because I think it really points out what it is that uh, books can mean if we let them. Can you imagine being a long way gone from home, having Tuesdays with Maury, getting water for elephants at the circus, being a bike racer, and being told it's not about the bike, being the greatest kite runner in your town, or perhaps sold into child prostitution. I couldn't, or at least not until I read these books. Can you imagine being a long way from home? Um, book after book, page after page, my journey through life gained depth. I started this semester as a woman growing up in the early 30s, and I quickly realized I wasn't getting what I needed from that, and so I began having Tuesdays with Maury, learning the most about something feared by everyone, death. I then became an autistic child, reading the curious incident of the dog in a nighttime. I was a little boy trying to uncover a murder while I lived with this uncontrollable condition. I then stepped into the center ring and became a veterinarian in charge of getting water for elephants. I was caught in a love triangle aboard a moving train, wishing that it would just stop. Toward the end, she says, um, not only have I lived the lives of a dozen or more different people, I have opened the door to a great reading habit, enabling me to become hundreds of more people with the turn of a page. I have learned about the styles of writing used, especially the ones that I enjoy reading, and that has shown up in my writing. Reading nearly 2,483 pages this semester, I feel as if I have gained more knowledge about the world than I have just about writing. I have officially become a reader, not just a, this is my assigned book. I don't know about you, but I don't think I know anybody who picks a book off the shelf and doesn't intend, at least, to read the whole thing. 
Now, we all might not finish the books we take off the shelf, but we certainly aren't taking them off the shelf just to read what's on page 45 or what's on page 72 or what's on page 152. Well, at least not if we're uh, not 11th graders and we found out what's on those pages. Um, but true enough, 90% of the challenges that I've handled here at MP NCTE focus on something that happened on one particular page in a book. But no educator and no librarian that I know of selects a, a book for what's ever on page 32. They select it for the whole thing. None of us misunderstands Mark Twain's reasons for using the language he did. None of us expects Seeley to speak in standard English sentences or Shug to behave like anything but who she is in the color purple. And no one thinks John Green is a pornographer because there's a sex scene in one of his novels. We can help our neighbors and our colleagues and others to understand that we read books for the whole book, not just for one page, and that we understand whatever it is that happens in the book, or whoever it is that says it, that person is a character in a fictional world, and they're behaving in character there. Penny Kittle, in her letter that she sends home at the beginning of the year to her students' parents, says this, the best books challenge our beliefs by helping us see through different eyes to live a different life. For example, 19 Minutes by Jody Pico was wildly popular last year, but it is about a school shooting, and I think we'd all rather believe that that couldn't happen in our school and don't want to live in the details. Yet, reading allows us to confront our worst fears and live through them. Students love this book, and I recommend it to them. I belong to uh, two book groups, and I'm always surprised and delighted with how my book group colleagues uh, perceive a book, how they react to it, and within any given group, some love it and some hate it maybe, um, what they think meant most to them about the text. And the most fun, of course, is spending an hour or two discussing the book and seeing what we can pull out of it all together. The NCTE principles for intellectual freedom begin this way. All students have the right to materials and education, educational experiences that promote open inquiry, critical thinking, diversity in thought and expression, and respect for others. Denial or restriction of this right is an infringement of intellectual freedom. The principles go on um, to talk about how to preserve those intellectual, how to preserve intellectual freedom in our educational system and to foster democratic values, how we as, as trained teachers and librarians can not only select text, but we are the qualified ones to be doing that, how professional ed educators should play an integral role in curriculum design, and how educational communities should pre prepare for challenges to what they've chosen. I've never run into a school district that didn't have a mission that went something like this. This happens to be the one from the town I live in, Urbana, Illinois. To provide a quality education by vigorously fostering high expectations for individual growth within a nurturing and just environment, enabling each student to become self-sufficient, productive and caring, and responsible as a member of a changing society. And it is the law that schools teach controversial material, that we all, if we're teaching, teach controversial material, whether we like it or not. And there are several law uh, cases that say it so.
tap into your colleagues when you're getting ready to prepare for Band Books Week. I always say that two heads are better than one, and frankly, three are better than two. And it would be great if the entire staff not only knew what you were doing, but knew things such as uh, the fact that there are um, books banned in other subjects besides English or reading. Over the, over the centuries, books have been banned in science, in social studies, in math, in art. Um, I don't know about PE, but I bet if we looked, we could find one, certainly in health. Um, and, and it's important that everybody gets to talk about that and shares about that. Besides, many hands make light work, and light work together builds buy-in. So you could be having these conversations while you're uh, making a display or thinking about what should go in it. And you'll all be the wiser for it. Um, do, by the way, to the list at the bottom, uh, not only your principal, director, department chair, or board, but you could also, if you're in a high school, check with your department chair or a grade school, maybe your grade level chair, um, just so everybody's in on it. I would suggest not just a display, but an interaction with people. Not just one week, but all year long. This year's uh, Band Books Week focuses on YA literature. And um, in one of our NCTE publications, uh, there was this little blurb about what that is. What is it, then, about adolescent literature that makes it popular with adolescents of all kinds, the bright, the less able, voracious readers, and those who must be coerced into turning the pages of other books. Donaldson and Nielsen offer a compelling argument that popular adolescent novels focus on common and contemporary adolescent problems, alienation, love, very much including sex, identity, parent and sibling relationships, mental illness, sports, schools, drugs. Teens probably call such books realistic, though surely the realism Realism is glossed over romance, in which adolescent protagonists rise to heroic heights or fall into dark depths that few readers can do more than imagine. Let's start a conversation about the importance of literacy and how fundamental and how essential it is to the success of our democracy. And I would most like to entertain your questions, should you have them. So we have an opportunity. Feel free to. Go ahead, Millie. I was just going to say, feel free to type them in the chat box. Comments are welcome as well. Or other ideas on how to collaborate with your colleagues. Kathy, that was a, um, a graphic I found when I Googled into um, First Amendment. So it's, it's not one of our artworks this year. Um, so we don't have it available as um, something you can purchase. And I have to thank Luann is the artist behind the slides. Luann. Kristen is the artist behind the slides, not Millie. So we should thank her. Um, challenges to books, um, in response to Luann's question there, um, in general, I've been busier the last couple years than, than not, uh, and then in prior years. Um, and challenges are also seasonal. So 
this is the time of the year when we often get a lot of challenges that are the result of the summer reading list that many schools use. Um, and we stay pretty busy right up till um, the break, um, mid-year. And we get a little bit of a rest and then get busy again. And then the summer, as a rule, is pretty quiet as far as challenges go. But I have to tell you that um, this year there have been many challenges um, where people think the result is to uh, put an MPAA rating on a book. Um, and right now we're dealing with a very sticky wicket um, in Florida where um, the school district uh, has decided they'll just send their um, kids' library records to the parents so the kids don't have a private place in the school at least to check out books. Takes such a long time between the typing and the actual, the actual uh, question to appear. Not that we're slow typers. I think it's the magic of technology. So Christina asks, I am a middle school librarian and want to make my seventh and eighth grade graders aware of banned books through more than just a display. What do you suggest? Um, some of the resources that you're going to find um, at the end of the webinar are some great lesson activities that you can maybe collaborate with teachers within your school for 7th and 8th graders. Um, beyond just a display, there are things they can do when they come into the library, like um, they can do, they can participate in the Banned Books Week virtual readout by videotaping the them reading one of their favorite books um, and submitting those to the Banned Books Week YouTube channel. Um, and so there's lots of activities and resources available that um, we can link you up with. Millie, any other ideas for 7th and 8th graders? Um, I was just going to say get them involved. So they can as much make their own um, awareness with a little guidance, guidance um, as you can, and ultimately they'll probably like it better. So um, maybe you start with the discussion about what book banning is and and why, and then maybe they think about it and they decide to do book trailers about it or some something about their favorite characters. They could have a, a mock debate about a book, so you could assign um, pros and cons, and they could debate up the, the resources about it. Let's see. Uh, so, Luann, we are experiencing, yes, more challenges at the university level in the last couple of years than we have seen ever before. That's not to say they didn't happen before. Um, and there's a marvelous article in um, this month's The Atlantic called The Coddling of the American Mind, I think that's the name of it, that speaks to uh, this very issue. Is that the article that touches on the Duke University issue where the freshmen um, no, because that issue, I mean, that issue arose after the article was written, but it's, but it's, a, a, they're one in the same in, in, in uh, what's happening. So Duke, Duke happened before that article was, after that article was written, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Christina says, it's a little bit different with high school versus middle school. You have to be a little bit more sensitive. Um, well, 
Well, you have to know your kids for sure, and you have to know your policies. Um, and uh, somebody else asked about the difference between libraries and classes. So libraries, as I would define it, are, are there to have a book for everyone. That is, all sorts of books, many, many books, many, many topics, whether we agree with them or not, whether we like the book, value it or not. Um, classrooms um, often um, are teaching one book for all the students. And um, I, while I personally wouldn't recommend that anymore, I would suggest you teach multiple books, mostly because there are so many and because you can get so many ideas on the table and have the students put them together. But um, challenges often come when it's uh, in the classroom, at least. It's, it's one book, the same book for every student. Okay. Thank you, Millie. Um, like I said, there'll be more time at the end for more questions. So I started my career as a young adult librarian in Wisconsin. In 2009, I went through a very emotional and public challenge to over 80 YA books with gay, lesbian, and trans characters and content. In the end, the books stayed on the shelf. In 2014, I was hired as the assistant director for the Office of Intellectual Freedom at ALA in Chicago. I work with state library associations and coordinate online education about the freedom to read and navigating challenges. Most days, I spend my time talking to and supporting librarians and teachers going through challenges. When I think back to the West Bend Library Challenge, I know things would have turned out differently if we'd had more conversations about intellectual freedom before the challenge occurred. The library director and board were knowledgeable and supportive, but when the complainant took her concerns to the city council and the mayor, I was shocked by their lack of knowledge about libraries, our policies, and the First Amendment. The administration made their opinions well known. One elected representative told the local paper that the library was a porn shop and to just get rid of the books. And while aldermen don't, didn't have the authority to remove the books from the library, they could control who was appointed as a library board member. Four board members were not reinstated um, to the board, to the library board, at the, in the April elections. The reason given was that they were unqualified. And you can see in the news article here um, some of the thoughts from our aldermen. Our board president had served on for the, had served on our library board for 30 years. She supported the library building, budget, and staff expansions, all while working as an elementary school librarian. And yet they considered her unqualified. So I wonder what would have happened if intellectual freedom conversations had been encouraged five years ago and there had been more talk with our colleagues about Banned Books Week and Intellectual Freedom. The goals of these conversations is to create awareness of a principle that often gets neglected until it's too late. We celebrate the freedom to read during this weekly event, sorry, during this week-long event, but it can also be a great opportunity to lay a foundation in case a challenge happens to you. In it places you in a position of knowledge and support, whether it's within a library system or your state or your own building. When questions come up, you're only an email away. We want librarians and educators to think about these issues and ask questions. We want Banned Books Week to be encouraged within professional communities and not shied away from. I'm not going to suggest that tomorrow you knock on your supervisor's door with the 100 most frequently challenged books list in hand, which I can provide for you if you needed it. But I encourage you to find out who answers to whom. Who are the decision makers in your library? 
When I started at West Bend Library, I was fresh out of library school. I knew my director, my assistant director, and my colleagues. Behind the curtain were some unknown people who met once a month, but I wouldn't have been able to tell you their names or identify them at the grocery store. They made obscure decisions about how to pay for the roof leak, but I didn't think it had anything to do with my day-to-day -day tasks. But they do. If you're relatively new to your organization, you have a great excuse. You can ask questions about um, the hierarchy. You can request meetings to meet people and to, to figure things out and find out what the policies are and what the procedures are. If you're a seasoned vet, you can start the conversation in the guise of training newbies. And since you have to train new people, you may as well include the whole staff. You could ask your supervisor, can we put up a display for Band Books Week at the end of September? And then you could follow it up with, can I buy a poster for the display? Or maybe that there are buttons that go with the theme, and I'd love to order a few and give them to school board members. That's a great way to finagle an invitation to a board meeting. And when the board members get their buttons, they may have a few questions. They may want to know about the history of Band Books Week, or what are the most common Band Books? Um, why do we support this? And then you can sell your pitch. And that leads me right into agendas and calendars. There are opportunities for more formal conversations, like prepared statements and presentations about Band Books Week or intellectual freedom issues. And there are informal conversations that happen more organically. Sometimes the conversation can happen in person, casually in the hall or even prompted online. And sometimes the conversation um, needs to be more thought out. School is starting, and while it is undoubtedly busy for many, many school teachers and school librarians, there are still ways to insert the topic here and there. Maybe your um, director has a column in the newsletter. Maybe there are book reviews that go out in the newspaper. Maybe there are in-service meetings. Or there are organizations you work with on a regular basis who would also like to help the library support the freedom to read. Maybe there's a calendar of events. You can see from the Demco calendar here that Band Books Week is down on the 27th through the 30th. It's not a standard Band Books Week calendar, but it's included. And it puts that thought out there, and it starts those conversations. It opens the door. You can find out who the calendar events coordinator is. Is it the school, the district, um, the community? Do you have a library one a, um, just for your library, or one for the whole community calendar of events? Put the dates on the calendar, and you could do a fun note, like ask Miss Kate to recite the First Amendment for you. Or check out the display of your seventh grade teacher's favorite challenged books outside the library. If you're putting something together, for a more formal conversation to stakeholders, whether they're board members, parents, or administration, outline the key points you want to make. I've always had luck when I can tie the topic or the request back to the institute's mission statement and how to better serve users. And even better if I can pull in the Library Bill of Rights or an ALA policy. You want to be clear. What is it that you want? Do you want to be added to the agenda to propose the Library Board review the reconsideration policy? Do you want to substitute the, man the monthly staff meeting for intellectual freedom training? Do you want to schedule a Skype author visit with a censored author? You want to anticipate the questions and continually bring it back to the mission of the library and how you can best serve the people and the staff that you work with. Why should the library be invested in this? It could be an investment of time or money. What will the benefits be? Who will do the work? What would be the downside? Make it very clear that, you prior, that your priority is the library and that by allowing this request, the library and its staff, budget, and rep reputation will benefit. 
If you're working on something, you can always call our office and send us an email to consult with you on your proposal or your talking points. What's ultimately really great about initiating Band, band Books Week conversations is that you get to be Lucy. While it's common knowledge that librarians are a wealth of information, it can now include specialized topics like intellectual freedom. Band Books Week shouldn't be scary or nerve-wracking or confrontational. It's about ideas and passion and knowledge. But some people might need a little extra guidance and information to jump on board. And we want to help prepare you to do that. As Benjamin Franklin says, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. And we want you to have wildly successful Banned Books Weeks at your library. So before Millie and I move on to the, um, the resources that we've put together for you, if you have any questions for me, Thanks, Kathy. I'd also like to really encourage other people to share ideas if they have had experience with um, having conversations and, and starting the talks about Banned Books Week and intellectual freedom issues um, in their professional communities, whether it be a school or public library, um, to share those ideas with everybody. Otherwise, what I'll do is let's move on to the resources. Millie and I can talk about these a little bit. So we put together um, some links of different resources to make Band Books Week really successful in your community. And if you have any questions or ideas of what you'd really like to see that we can help prepare for you, here Jillian says. about talking to adult patrons. Millie, you can unmute your mic if you'd like. So Luann had a good idea about getting the PTA involved. The, um, the only thing I can think of for Jillian's question would be the law that governs um, the idea that if that person doesn't like the book, that's fine, but they don't have the right to take that book away from someone else. And um, let me find those law cases for you. And if the ideology argument doesn't work with them, um, you might also say that by moving the book and hiding the book, um, the item becomes lost, and that's taxpayer dollars that are wasted, um, that the book might have to be replaced, that it's time and money that's spent um, looking for the book if somebody else wants it. Um, so organizationally, it, it's also problematic.
Yeah, I've got law cases that are educational, so I'm not going to help you very much here. But I'm certain there are ones about libraries. You know, Jillian, um, I'm going to share another link with you. Um, Kate Lechtenberg and I did a document for school librarians um, that is on the Banned Books Week website. And she did a video, a YouTube video for her students in a very neutral, positive way. And this is also goes to show for the um, dealing with 7th and 8th graders um, for middle school students. The, the power of reading. And if you don't think a book, well, I'll just share it with you, um, is right for you, that you can put it down or talk about it with an adult. And it's a very neutral, safe, um, positive video. Millie, can you see if there are any other new questions coming up on the chat while I look for this real quick? Oh, you bet. So I, too, would add that I would approach it from um, the side of the importance of literacy um, and, and every book that is you know, banned is taking literacy away from somebody um, and, and the connection between um, literacy and and democracy. Um, I don't know how far that will fly with somebody that doesn't have the same ideas, but the other piece of it is often people with different ideas really want just to be heard. And you may be able to reach a point in discussion where you agree to disagree, but the behavior like hiding the books would go away in the midst of that disagreement. So um, meeting people as people is helpful. Um, not easy sometimes, but definitely helpful. And it's such a wonder in our country, too, that um, we have the availability of marvelous libraries and and good schools and I don't know what percentage of the world but very much of the world has does not have that advantage and um, maybe sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Val, I just read something um, from a school, li um, an academic librarian and her idea for Banned Books Week was to talk about some of the more philosophical ideas that have been challenged, not so much the banning, but um, different textbooks and concepts, kind of bringing it a little bit higher education. Um, and they did like a lecture series, I think, in the academic library. I'll see if I can find that resource for you. So, Val, when you say to, um, what state organizations have done to promote this issue within the state, do you mean promote the issue of uh, preparing for Banned Books Week? That's on your site, is it not, Kristen? I think so. And the events, I will tell you, events are starting to be populated on the Banned Books Week site. Let me see if I find them for you. That um, and you can get yours in there, too. I know I heard from a, um, a library not far from here, maybe in Indiana, that was doing a whole Robert Cormier um, display it was featuring him for Banned Books Week. And so I think that is probably up on here now. Millie, um, I just highlighted on the resources page this Find and Share Local BBW events. 
this is where they can go to yeah. input um, their own local events for states. Oh, perfect. Yeah. And I think people are also sharing a good deal using the Band Books Week hashtag mm -hmm. on Twitter. So if you if you're your state IFC, if you if you're working with the intellectual freedom within your state, um, keep an eye open for libraries that are sharing those resources about what they're doing, um, and encourage them to share them for the BandBooksWeek.org website, and that way um, New Mexico can have a really strong presence of Band Books Week events that are going on. Um, that can be that anybody in the state can find. The, one of the resources that I have found um, to be really great for kind of re-energizing. Um, I know if you put up a display for Band Books Week every year, it can get a little bit dry, and one of the places I like to go is really for Pinterest because it's so visual and you know when you Google display idea you know what to do for Band Books Week and it says put up a display and you're like eh my copy of Mice and Men is really grungy looking but if you go to Pinterest um, you can really see some of the great fantastic creative ideas that other librarians have put together that are um, really inspiring and kind of get those creative juices um, flowing as far as how they did things, you know, um, grassroots-wise. They didn't spend a lot of money on it, and it can really kind of inspire you that way. Fun thing that um, uh, people were doing just, uh, well, they're doing it for Poetry Month mostly, but you can make set books on their sides and make a spine poem. So you could have kids do that using books that are banned books see what they got as a result. And there's lots of YouTube videos that talk about Band Books Week. It can be used both educationally in a classroom or in a more formalized setting. Or if you just want to share them on your Facebook and Twitter page just to kind of get the conversation started and starting to promote the event, um, the, the videos can be really well done. My favorite, um, I think Millie had said her favorite too, was um, well, the, the Dave Pilkey one, because he does it all in art, is really creative. Um, so that's here, the Dave Pilkey one. Um, a lot of them are good interviews that talk about it. Um, the Bookman store has uh, was really creatively well done. That could be another um, way to celebrate Band Books Week is to create a video that's promotional about Band Books Week, and that you could do that with middle school students because they love to be creative. And I always had when I was a young adult librarian, um, my teen volunteers create a promotional video for summer reading program. Um, and they love to get the script and get mic'd and act all goofy and creative. And um, there wasn't necessarily the need to be cool yet. Um, and so you could really get them to do something funny for Band Books Week. Um, I'm sure we could find some kind of scripts that you could do to promote the ideas. Or yep. they could write their own. They could even make it into a song and do like some videos I've seen where the whole school gets involved in a in a big happening event. A band books week flash mob. There you go. Are there any other thoughts or questions about um, band books week? Oh, good, Deborah. I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, um, we do have um, grants available through the Krug Fund at the Freedom to Read Foundation. So if you have some really great ideas and they're just in need of some funding, don't hesitate to apply for these ideas. Um, apply for this grant, and you can get some some money to support your idea. Um, the winners this year of the grant, I think there are five winners. Um, One of them I know is the trading cards. I love these. I have these in my office. The Chapel Hill Library did trading cards where they did um, 
artwork inspired by a banned book. This is Perks of Being a Wallflower. And then on the back, it talks about um, what the book is, the reason for the banning, who the artist is, and the artist's statement. I chose this book to acknowledge my love and respect for my uncle, who is homosexual. The gay relationship within its covers is never put down as negative. Being afraid of the truth has never, been, has never brought people equality. And there's a whole collection of these. This is Leaves of Grass. And the Scarlet Letter. So w w Wanda put in there that um, that she did a card game. So is that that different from the one? Yeah, the these are just trading cards, um, and they have some information on them, but they're not a game. You just kind of collect them as artwork. Ah, okay. There is talks about a game in the future um, that hasn't been designed yet. going to tell us about Oh, I'd love to hear more, Wanda. So our time is coming to an end. It's 3.56. Um, make sure I've got everything down here. So these resources are available. Um, most of them are searched here. I wish it had a like button in the in the uh, chat area that we could just push the like button. Yeah, FTRF is a ideas. trump card. I love it. Um, the recording will be available as well as the resources. I'll email that out to everybody um, with all the links on it, so you'll have all the resources. And I want to thank everyone again for attending. I've posted multiple ways that you can reach the Office for Intellectual Freedom. Anyone can call our office with a question or to report a challenge. There's a link to a short survey asking for your feedback on this webinar, and we'll let you know when the recording of the program is available. Luann, that's a great idea. Cards Against Censorship. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> Kathy, it's not a picture of Tango. Um, I was looking for a graphic that said thank you rather than words, and I wanted a funny animal. But it was just a penguin. But now I'm going to officially call him Tango. Thanks. Yeah. Maybe it's Tango's brother. Millie, any last thoughts? Thanks to everybody for coming. Um, I think we've got a lot of great ideas going here. I wish I could go around and see them all. Maybe you'll video them and yes. put them up on the website. Share your ideas. Hashtag Band Books Week. You bet, Kathy. <laughs>